Good morning. I'm Carlos Fernandez, Public Policy Manager of the Vegas Chamber. I'd like to thank you all for tuning to Eggs and Issues, featuring Congressman Mark Amade of Nevada's 2nd Congressional District. And to introduce him, please welcome the Vegas Chamber President and CEO, Mayor Beth Seawall. Thank you so much, Carlos, and good morning, everybody. Good morning, Congressman. It's great to see your face. Welcome to our virtual uh, edition of Eggs and Issues today. We've got the issues, but no eggs, so hopefully you've grabbed a cup of coffee and you have your own style of eggs today for this insightful conversation with us. In just a few minutes, we're going to hear from Congressman Amade, and he's going to share the latest, of course, from what all that is going on in Washington, D.C., Couple of opportunities I wanna highlight just real quickly for you. First, please join us on Monday, December 7th at 8 a.m. for another virtual Eggs and Issues with U.S. Senator Catherine Cortez Masto. Senator Cortez Masto has been a champion for our state, especially during COVID-19, along with Congressman Amade. We look forward to her perspective for 2021 as well. And you can go to vegaschamber.com to sign up for that. On Thursday, December 10th, you're not gonna to wanna to miss our annual State of the Chamber luncheon and the installation of our brand new chairwoman, Gina Bon Jovi. You'll get to hear what's ahead for the Vegas Chamber in 2021. And you'll also get to meet our 2021 uh, chairwoman of the Board of Trustees along with the rest of trustees as well. So for your safety, that event is also gonna be virtual. Uh, so please do be part of our celebration via Zoom. We're very excited about that. So to sign up for that, you can also go to VegasChamber.com. And then last but not least, leadership development is an important thing for any business, especially during these times. So we're accepting enrollment into our Leadership Advance program right now. Leadership Advance provides talented professionals at all levels of training and tools necessary to be better and more effective leaders. So we're really excited for that new class and uh, we, we really encourage you to, to sign up for that as well. And now it is my honor to introduce Tom Burns. He's the chairman of the Board of Trustees at the Vegas Chamber, and he's also the president of Cragen and Pike. Good morning, Tom. Good morning, Mary Beth. Thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, I want to thank all of you for joining us this morning. Uh, we really appreciate your attendance and, and your loyalty to the Chamber. You know, the Chamber works very hard to represent you at all levels of government, and uh, because we know how much it impacts your business on a daily basis. I'd like to recognize uh, Senate Councilman Scott Black from uh, the city of North Las Vegas in attendance today. Thank you, Councilman, for being here. We appreciate it very much. I'd also like, like to recognize the members of the Board of Trustees that are here today. That would include uh, Danielle Blisterfield, Michael Bon Jovi, uh, <laughs> Bolognini, Gina Bon Jovi, Michael Bonner, Alex Dixon, Michael Federer, Betsy Fretwell, Lisa Halfield, Mark Hutchison, Rob Novotny, Tina Quigley. Chase Rankin, Larry Singer, Victoria Van Mietren, and Ryan Woodward. And also a special uh, thanks to Mary Beth Seawalt, who's been an outstanding leader throughout this entire year. And I've been an honor to work with her. You know, to delivering quality programs like this takes sponsorships and support from our, from our members. And so we'd like to recognize Cox Communications as our presenting member, along with other sponsors, such as Allegiant Airline, GC Garcia, the Howard Hughes Corporation, NV Energy, the Porter Group, Southwest Gas, Sunrise Health System, Switch Communications, and Toro Universities. We'd like to thank you for your generous support of eggs and issues and other quality events that are put on by the Chamber. Now I'd like to turn it over to Craig Stevens, who is the Senior Manager of Government Affairs and Regulatory Issues for Cox Communications. Craig? Thanks, Tom, and it's really good to see you. So it's my honor today to introduce the Congressman from Nevada's 2nd Congressional District, Mark Amaday. Congressman Amade consistently works in the best interests of Nevadans, represents our state with integrity, honesty, and a true love for our state. Congressman Amade currently serves on the House Appropriations Committee and two of its subcommittees, as well as the Army Caucus, Congressional Joint Strike Fighter Caucus, USO Caucus, and the Congressional Western Caucus. Congressman Amade has represented our state on both the state, local, and federal level. He served on the Nevada State Assembly from 1996 to 1998 before transferring to the Nevada State Senate. He served on the Senate from 98 to 2010 and was President Pro Temp from 2003 to 2008. Congressman, we're so grateful for your insight to come here today to share about legislation and resources at the federal level in regard to COVID-19. We also look forward to your unique perspective on the changing dynamics in Washington, D.C. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Congressman Mark Amaday. Thank you for that. Uh... Thank you for that warm introduction. Uh, I, I got to take a minute after that to compose myself. Uh, and, and I also want to thank you and the, and the chamber and Mary Beth and, and uh, President Tom uh, 
for uh, being a little patient. I know we had another one of these scheduled a little while back and I'm not sure what happened. It seems like there's a, a, enough this is and that's going on to where everything has to be attempted twice, but thank you for your patience and sticking with us on this. Um, I wish I was at uh, one of your great venues uh, down there in, uh, in Las Vegas, uh, the Four Seasons or any of the other places that we've done this before, but I guess this will do until later. Um, I, I wanna say that I, I was down uh, in Las Vegas on Monday uh, down and back the same day, and uh, um, I'm very much looking forward to um, when the best route from the airport to a venue downtown or along the Strip uh, isn't Tropicana and uh, Las Vegas Boulevard South because the traffic's light, and I'll just I'll just leave it at that. But thank you, folks, for what you're doing on behalf of the private sector and your continued involvement in uh, in local and state and federal affairs. Uh, and I'll look forward to when we uh, when we can resume the fact that you folks take over DC for a night like you've done in the past. Um, as I sit back here today, this is the second um, full week, sort of, that Congress has been in session after the election. Um, we're scheduled to vote at 6:30 tonight, tomorrow at uh, I think five o'clock, and Friday at noon. So far, there are um, there is no COVID relief answer that's been announced, although the group that I'm part of with Susie Lee and uh, others in the Senate, as well as the House on both sides of the aisle, has uh, produced another COVID relief bill that's at about 900 plus billion dollars for the consideration of the White House, uh, the Senate, and, and obviously the House. We'll see where that goes. Um, the present schedule, although they're always subject to change, um, it is to have us working through next uh, a week from tomorrow, next Thursday, but uh, I, I don't know. Um, quite frankly, it's uh, it's a good thing that that uh, nobody around here makes plans before Christmas for vacation, because uh, I'm not sure whether even before New Year's before vacation is a great idea. There's still a there's still a heck of a lot to do in terms of all the appropriations bills, defense authorization as well as a COVID, uh, another COVID package. I'm gonna say a little bit more on the COVID package and then I think we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and, and see what's on your folks' minds. Um, it is surprising to me that there wasn't something done before the election. Um, and now here we are post-election for about a month. And uh, quite frankly, there's still nothing that's like imminent or anything else like that. And I will just say this, it is my opinion that that's because in, in some people in key positions of leadership's minds, the focus on politics is taking precedent on, over the focus on policies and solutions. And so um, I don't know whether that play ultimately ends up in, uh, we're gonna have to wait until after January 20th um, or we get something done before that. But uh, I'll just say that it's my opinion that if any weight that we've already endured and have to endure after that is a focus where, where somebody is, is, uh, is quite frankly, has prioritized politics over providing some much needed relief in this area. So with that, fire away folks. Hey, thank you, Congressman. I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions. I, I wanna remind our participants that you can ask questions a couple of ways of the Congressman. You can hit the raise your hand button and you'll be called upon. You can unmute, unmute yourself at that point, ask the Congressman his, your question, and then uh, remute yourself if you would. And the other way you can do it is to send the question through the chat room and we'll read the question to the Congressman. So again, Congressman, we're glad you're here. Do, do you think there's any solution to, the, to, to what you just referenced? Is, is there a way to get a COVID bill, uh, support bill out of, the, out of Congress by the end of the year? Well, of course, that there are some ways. There, there are ways to get it out before that. You know what I think the major hangup is, or, or at least I'm told, um, is that the major hangup on this right now is um, that there were many states, Nevada is not one of them, um, that quite frankly had pre-COVID uh, uh, books problems. You know, the, the, they had deficit problems, they had whatever. And so in the old Rahm Emanuel thing, you never want to waste a good crisis. Right. And I'm not going to pick on Rahm, but, but, it, but it's like, this is not an opportunity to try to do a bailout of some of those larger states that, that have had um, 
uh, the balance of the books problems and, and use this as, while we're doing it, let's go ahead and take care of that too. Um, and, and so I, I'll just tell you this, and, and listen, I hope I'm wrong, but, but quite frankly, it's like, hey, we're gonna try to basically help out some of those larger, a lot of red ink states um, on this, even though that red ink wasn't related to, to COVID. And so obviously I, I think my tone of voice says, I don't think that's a great idea. Um, quite frankly, the 3 billion that we sent in the initial CARES legislation, uh, which provided over $14 billion to Nevada in stuff that didn't have to be paid back. Um, none of that money was sitting in the US treasury um, and, and so obviously you say, well, what's that mean? That, that means we borrowed it. Um, that was a value judgment. I voted to borrow it. Um, and, and so you can say what you want, but quite frankly, given the choices at the time, I think it was the right thing to do. I don't want to do over on that. Um, there's more work to be done, but I think it needs to be as fiscally responsible as possible. And quite frankly, bailing out states that are in, that are in the red um, pre-COVID is, is not what's on there because as, as you folks know, as well as anybody, what's happened for the Southern Nevada economy, it quite frankly is a big enough challenge right now for the federal government. And we shouldn't be going back and holding people harmless for stuff that had nothing to do with federal responsibility or COVID. Sure, sure. You know, what, one of the issues that comes up a lot in uh, Nevada, especially Southern Nevada, uh, is the ability to diversify our economy. We got a question from our audience Wanting to know what your thoughts are there, if you have any insight in how we how we do that better and quicker. Well, you know, it's it's interesting because it used to be, hey, uh, if you like Las Vegas, um, in terms of a place to visit, let's live there. I mean, look at what you've got and what's been done so far in terms of you've got the Knights, you've got the WNBA, um, you've got the Raiders now, you've got all sorts of stuff in terms of of the airports authorities with Rosemary Vasiliadis and her folks has worked in terms of making it a hub for um, other commercial activities other than just uh, the resort and hospitality industry. Um, but, but now we have to take another look and say, okay, so what does office look like in the post COVID age in terms of the telecommuting stuff? What does retail look like in the post COVID age in terms of bricks and mortar? And, and listen, I'm an old guy I mean, the fashion show mall was one of the nicest places in the world an old guy can go. Um, so, and, and you know, the outlets north and south, depending on what kind of mood you're in and all that other sort of stuff. So you're sitting there going, you know, when we talk about getting back to normal and your folks would, would be more knowledgeable about this than me, but normal is, is going to be a new definition in terms of, you know, the Hughes Center with all that commercial uh, office real estate and, and other venues in town. And, and, and in the other towns. So when you talk about diversification, I think, you know, um, you're talking about airport hub, you're talking about logistics, you're talking about warehousing, you're talking about a whole lot of things, except that the definition of three years ago when the economy was, was doing so phenomenally well is going to be different a after this, I think. But let me tell you what, the fact that, that the casino resort hospitality industry is as strong in Las Vegas and surrounding areas anywhere is nothing to be ashamed of. It's just a great big piece of the puzzle to be nurtured, but you know, your potential is unlimited. Obviously the folks at, uh, at the Southern Nevada Water Authority are doing a, doing a good job of making what you have go further. And, and that's something that you can probably say, never say mission accomplished, but they're doing a good job. And, and so it's like, so what is the economy for Southern Nevada and the Southwest in general look like um, in terms of the post COVID era and, and the working from home and the online presence. Sure. Uh, one of our uh, trustees, Alex Dixon, wanted to know if you uh, had any insight as to the vaccine distribution. Well, actually we, uh, we just got some more information from the folks at CDC and also the state folks uh, in terms of about 60 days ago, CDC provided, I think it was a billion eight or something like that to the state of Nevada in terms of to, to set up distribution uh, infrastructure for when that comes. It's being distributed right now on a per capita basis. So I don't have the number of what that is per person, but um, as a Clark County person, you'll know that, that we expect 70, 75% of those funds to go to the Clark County Health District 
and, and go through that in terms of getting ready. I can also tell you that before that point in time, part of what was done under Operation Warp Speed was to make sure that there were plenty of needles, plenty of syringes, plenty of all the stuff that it needs other than just saying, here's the vaccine, now how do we get it out? So, and, and that was what the, uh, uh, one of the four-star general in the army who's the chief of logistics was in charge of that. So I'm not gonna tell you it's gonna be a seamless rollout, although I hope I'm wrong and it is, but they've at least tried to triage that and think about it a lot beforehand so that when they start arriving, and there'll be a priority system. Right now, generally, the first, uh, the first priority of the five will be first responders and healthcare workers, and then it goes down after that based on vulnerability and stuff like that. But obviously, with the, with the, uh, with the groups, there were about six groups that are working on it. Three or four of them are now through their final stages and getting the uh, FDA authorization to put those out. But I can tell you that there are somewhere north of 22 million doses of vaccine that, that were already manufactured before the election and that the mass manufacturing facilities were being brought online to, to make that number larger. So obviously your person has hit on, okay, now that you've got that and now that you've got the manufacturing capability, how are we gonna get it out to, to the cities and towns in that? And so I, I think they're doing a pretty good job on that so far, but nobody's saying mission accomplished. So we'll keep an eye on it. Great. Um, Congressman uh, Gina Bongiovi is the incoming chair. Uh, she has in a mere eight days, she will be christened my successor. So she's very important to me. And she has a question for you. Uh, she says, as recently as the 21st, the IRS has said it would disallow deductions for expenses that would otherwise be deductible business expenses if the taxpayer received forgiveness under the PPP. Many people feel that this flies in the face of the intent of the PPP program. Is this on the uh, legislators' radars in DC? And if so, is the IRS likely to change its position? Well, I agree with her. Yes, it's at the top of the radar screen in terms of one of the tweaks in a new COVID bill, um, because quite frankly, you don't have to get up too early in the morning to say, if we're trying to encourage you to stay in business by basically giving you loans that are forgiven, which we should just cut to the quick and call those grants, uh, we shouldn't tax you now on the fact that you got the grants. So um, I, I, will, I will tell you this, I will get with uh, Mary Beth afterwards and give you the, the complete rundown on what the status is, what the proposal is in terms of the language fixing that so that you folks can be absolutely up to speed on it. We'll have that to you, Mary Beth, uh, within uh, two hours of the end of this call. Fabulous. Um, uh, Lisa Howfield, who's the general manager of G general manager of Channel Eight here in Southern Nevada, said, "Good morning, Congressman. Thank you for your service to Nevadans. Your direct approach to representing the people of our state is much appreciated. If the bill does get passed for nine hundred, uh, this is nine hundred million. I think she means nine hundred billion. How much of it's going to be divided amongst the individual states, and how much would be earmarked for our, for uh, the state of Nevada?" Well, it, it, it's it's broken down into different categories, kind of like the first group was. So you'd have stuff that goes for education, K through 12. You'd have stuff that goes for higher education. You'd have hospitals. You'd have federally qualified health centers. You'd have Medicare providers. Um, you know, some of that went to paying for the National Guard to be basically um, not federalized, but under the control of Governor Sisolak. And, and so I would expect this to go the same way. There'll be more PPP money in that, things like that. Um, and then how it goes down state by state, it's, it's not, um, if she's referring to the state stabilization money, um, then that would be one of the categories. But, but let me tell you a lesson that, that I think we learned the last time, and, and that is quite frankly, um, sending it to the state, the stabilization funds to the state, and then letting the state distribute it, uh, quite frankly, at, at least in, in the Nevada experience, slow things down. Now in Clark County and the city of Las Vegas, because they were over 500,000 population, it went straight from the feds to those two entities. And quite frankly, they got their money for, in a fairly timely fashion. But everybody else um, went through a, a state process um, th th that I'll just tell you was not very timely in, in my view. And so the big change will be this. If we're gonna provide stabilization funds, then let's provide them 
directly to, for instance, school districts, directly to cities, directly to counties, um, so that that money does not get held up at the state level and in some cases politicized. Sure. We have another question from the audience of Mr. Andrew McKay, and this, this question is very poignant. We might not know the answer to it until uh, our friends in Georgia make some decisions, but he said with the upcoming shift in the administration, do you have any insight as to respect to, of, of what business taxation policies would be? <laughs> well, first of all, I know Andy McKay cheats on his federal income taxes, so I'm not sure I should even respond to that. You know? <laughs> but, but that's a secret. Don't anybody repeat that anywhere. Um, uh, you know, you look at the process here in terms of, so what's going on in the House, what's going to go on in the Senate, some of that's crystal ball in terms of, of uh, Georgia, everybody's got their opinions and, and scenarios, and what's going to go on within, within the administration. Um, I will tell you, having done this now for nine years, seems like a lot longer, that when you talk about change and rapid change, unless you have um, unless you have control over all three uh, entities, that being the Senate, the House, and the White House, it's, it's kind of tough. And even when you have control over all three of those entities, making change, if it's not going to be in a bipartisan manner, is, uh, can be a challenge. And we'll look back to the Obama administration when, quite frankly, Nancy Pelosi was the speaker for two years, Barack Obama was in the White House, and Harry Reid had 60 votes in the United States Senate. And you look at that whole agenda that was allegedly, you know, on the table there and, and what was done out of that, there was no immigration done. There was no major uh, labor changes done. What you got was the Affordable Care Act. And so um, we'll see. And I mean, you can accuse the Republicans of the same thing in terms of when, when they had John Boehner, Paul Ryan, um, you have Mitch McConnell and you had Donald Trump in the White House, quite frankly, you, you know, Republicans will say, well, we did the tax reform bill and you're going, so, so it took you two years to do that, kind of like it took the other folks two years to do the Affordable Care Act. So while I, I don't think it's like, well, don't worry about anything. It's like, obviously you worry about things, but, but I'll tell you right now with the dynamic in the House, even at, uh, at somewhere in the neighborhood of 213 to 223, um, that thin a margin is going to produce um, is going to produce some interesting dynamics in, in in terms of nobody gets a pass, and um, and that's on both sides of the aisle, by the way. So we'll see we'll see how that works out. Um, quite frankly, especially within thirty days of the election, we've all had a ton of prognostication and predictions of impending doom and death and suffering on no matter what happens. And so I'm kind of at the point now where it's like, well, let's see what happens after January 20th. And let's see how that rolls out for a little while and watch that dynamic because there are still, although you won't find this on the social media and you won't find it in any national news reporting, there are still people on the Hill in both bodies that have relationships with people on both sides of the aisle that can, you know, see how that works to, to somebody's benefit. And obviously, since it's the sad but true truth of the matter is the 22 cycle is already underway, um, I think there may have been there may have been for those people who are watching um, some lessons to be learned in terms of steering a path that's uh, that's more oriented towards production instead of politicization. Yeah. So, do you, do you think Nevada has become a swing state? Are we are we purple? Uh, well, you know that's a great question. Um, and somebody said, well, no, no, we're a blue state or, or, or we're or whatever. It's, it's like, well, I'll tell you this. When I look at the largest county in the state and see that the number two registered uh, group of voters there is nonpartisan, IAP, those type of folks, because, you know, us old folks say, well, you know, Clark County is a big, a big uh, uh, registered D side and you've got some R's and whatever. And, and for those people that are independents and nonpartisans, you say, well, they'll kind of break the way they do. We'll just concentrate on playing blue against red and, and let the chips fall where they may. I don't think you can do that anymore. And so when you say that, um, I think you have to say going forward, it's like it's time to figure out what, what's on those folks' minds and reach out to them. And I'm sure both parties are thinking about doing that already. And that's not just in Clark County. They're a big, they're a big chunk in, uh, in Washoe County. 
I think, uh, and I, I think it's partially a function of the motor voter thing, is, is that when DMV, if you, if you tell people you don't know what you got, then they'll put you down as nonpartisan. And so maybe that's part of it too, but quite frankly, it's a big number. The challenge is to get it to turn out like Democrats and Republicans do, but it's too big a number now to ignore. So when you say is Nevada red or is Nevada blue, it's like, well, I don't know. I think 15 counties are red. Uh, one's for sure purple uh, of the 16th. And then, then when you come to Clark, it's like, well, the history's been blue, but even with that, uh, with that margin of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the count for the presidential stuff this year, 33,000 votes uh, in the context of all the folks that voted in Nevada this time um, doesn't get anybody into the mandate category. So work in progress. Sure, sure. And I, I, I grew up in our, our fair state. I love it very much. Uh, and this is not a value judgment, being a, but being a Democrat in Nevada today is different than it was 30 years ago. Yeah, different than it was for Michael Callahan and Alan Bible and, right. and, and Richard Bryan. Richard Bryan, exactly, exactly. Uh, so, uh, Congressman, there's, there's rumors that you're interested in running for governor. Can you talk about that? Well, I, I can tell you this. It's, it's, uh, it's something where, um, quite frankly, we're going to look at it. Um, so I guess the answer is, yeah, I can talk about it. We're going to look at it. And as a matter of fact, uh, many of your members on this call are going to see us in the next uh, 30 to 60 days coming down and saying, hey, um, what do you think about, and, and as any practical person knows, uh, if you're going to do something like that, you have to have a pretty good organization statewide, and you got to get through a primary first, because there'll be more than one elephant running around, because I, I don't think it's news to anybody, but they think that Governor Sisolak in, in some ways has made himself vulnerable for re-election. I'm sure he doesn't agree with that, and I'm not going to be disrespectful, but it's like, so, so there's a lot of people kicking tires right now, and we're certainly going to kick our share of them here in the near future, because if it's something that you're going to do, um, that, then you have to get moving on it. Uh, you know, what is it? Signups are a year from March, folks. <laughs> I hate to say that, but anyhow, um, so yeah, we're going to be, we're going to be down uh, in your neighborhood as well as some others taking a look at, uh, at what that looks like. You know, one of the more important things that uh, both the U.S. Chamber and the uh, Vegas Chamber are interested in is infrastructure, and uh, specifically I-11, but other, but other things as well. Do you think there's a chance in the next Congress that we can move forward on some infrastructure bills? Well, I, I'll tell you this. Um, you know, that's another one of those ones where you say, tell me who's against it. I, I haven't heard of anybody talking against it. And so whether you're from, you know, whether you're from Ohio or you're from Southern California, or, or you're from the Carolinas or, or from Nevada, it's like nobody is speaking against this. Now there's a cost element, but quite frankly, that's solvable. Um, and, and so, you, you know, come up with some innovative ideas. Um, and, and quite frankly, it's, it's, never been, it's never been a better time to borrow money in terms of interest rates. I can tell you that in Nevada, even though when you talk infrastructure, for any community or state that, that's got some years on it, you always have aging infrastructure. So people's priorities are, are, are different in terms of what's the best bang for your buck and stuff like that. I-11 is something, quite frankly, when you talk about coming from, from south of Clark County through Arizona from, from the Mexican border up that, that I think is rightfully so, and I agree with my colleague, Dina Titus, and the other members of the delegation that that, that should be in terms of, of for sure, I mean, it's a slam dunk, interstate major new infrastructure, that's the deal. The biggest challenge in Clark County, quite frankly, is how do you go through, how do you get through Las Vegas without just hanging new signs on existing poles? Because I know the Federal uh, Department of Transportation doesn't like that. But I, I would think when you talk about labor likes it, suppliers like it, the private sector likes it for all the stuff that goes into it, the design work, your engineers, all that stuff. And, and so it, it's one of those things where, quite frankly, if a Biden administration wants to say we got something done that had been in the works for a long time, that would be a really, really low-hanging piece of fruit. Well, the, uh, the lines have lit up since you mentioned you're interested in running for governor. And so uh, one of the questions that's pretty, pretty common is, you know, how would you have handled the lockdown and how do we balance the need for business to be open in our economy to move forward with the safety of Nevadans? Well, quite frankly, I, I don't think one is exclusive of the other. 
I mean, it's the multitasking Olympics. And you know what? I mean, listen, um, some people can play games, but it's, it's like, like it or not, the pandemic is here. The challenge for leaders at the state level and at the federal level is this. How do you keep the economy going to minimize the, the fiscal destruction to your tax base? I mean, your members are all the tax base. How do you keep that going in a safe manner while dealing with the pandemic so that you minimize the exposure to that? And I'll tell you, the first way you start is you have to talk to the people on whom you're imposing those restrictions. And so when you talk about what you do with restaurants, who's a, who's a, uh, um, who is, who is a uh, critical industry, who should be open, who shouldn't be open, how all that is handled, quite frankly, needs to be the subject of some collaboration. Now, collaboration is, let's get a thousand people together on a Zoom call and see what we can all agree on. You know what will happen there. But you know what? You ought to be talking to the restaurant association people. You ought to be talking to those people on the strip. Quite frankly, they don't make money if people are getting sick and dying of COVID. But nonetheless, it, it seems like the approach here has been we're going to concentrate only on the health aspects. And by the way, there were phenomenally devastating consequences when basically at the beginning of this, hospitals and medical facilities were ordered not to perform any services that would be considered non-essential. That's how those folks pay the bills. So when we did the first CARES Act, a whole bunch of money went to Nevada hospitals and clinics because quite frankly, they got to pay people too. They got to pay the electric bill. They've got to have supplies. They've got to do all that stuff. They were darn close to having to shut their doors because they couldn't pay their bills. So when you talk about how would you do this, it's like, well, I get, I get a hold of the Clark County Health District. I get the folks in, in the resort association. I get some folks from the chamber and I go, how are we going to do this? I'm going to let you guys come up with the plans. And if, quite frankly, you turn out to be super spreaders, we're coming back and telling you you need to modify your plans. But this deal where you've got 24 hours to shut down or open up, I don't need to tell you people, that's not a great way to run a railroad. And by the way, it's also your tax base. So when you're basically impacting private industry in a deleterious fashion in terms of operation um, with no input from them, then you know, you've know you got shortages at the city level, at the county level, and at the state level for, for your tax base. And, and it's like, hey, as we know, even though, thank you, Vice President Pence and, and, and your group, because in eight months, we're at the point where we've got major vaccine progress and are talking at the beginning of this about how do we make sure it gets distributed. It's like, we still have to function as, as county, state, and, and federal governments and that means we need our tax bases healthy. So how would I be different? It's like I would had a heck of a lot more communication and give and take and giving those people who are responsible for those businesses more of a say and more of the steering wheel, if you will, and saying, tell me what your plan is. And, and if, if it makes any sense at all, we're going to go ahead and try it your way. And if that doesn't work, we're going to be back with you instead of going Here's how we're going to do it. One size fits all. Some people are winners. Most people are losers. And there just wasn't much consistency to it. And I think that's the source of a lot of frustration with the governor at the moment. You know, health care is always an issue that comes up in every election. And we're, we're, there's some questions about whether there's any movement to change the ACA or any improvement on health care in general. Well, I'll just tell you this. First of all, thank you, Las Vegas Chamber, for what you did in terms of forming your group. Uh, I know that's still in litigation. Um, we think your idea was a great one. We think it provided a great service to people for an option for health care, and we want it back. And so anything we can do to get that back because it was such a good option is something that, that we're all on board for. But that's not news. We've told you, we've told you that before. You know, when you scrub away all the political posturing, here's the deal. There are some good things in the Affordable Care Act, and we ought to keep them. There are some things they got right. So the political phrase of repeal and replace may have been expedient in some people's minds politically, but practically speaking, we know how tough it was to roll out all those exchanges on those websites and stuff like that when it first started up. The last thing you want to do in terms of not being smart is let's wipe everything out and start over again. That will produce the same sort of, oh my God, where am I and I can't get through and stuff like that. So the question is, what do you do with the tune-ups? Because quite frankly, the idea was 
How do we get that at its at its height? Nevada was down to 11% of folks didn't have health insurance. That was down from 22. Not mission accomplished, and we can kind of figure out who made up those 11%. But you say, how do we make sure these people have a safety net other than the emergency room? Um, and, and so how do we solve that? That's the issue, because quite frankly, as you know, your members that were on your health care program, police, fire, teachers, um, union members, they all have health plans, which quite frankly, they're by and large pretty happy with, and they don't want them replaced. And so when you hear this public option, um, Medicare for all, all those sorts of things, I, I've just been, and, and if I'm missing something, uh, maybe Andy McKay can let me know after he pays his taxes. Um, but, but it's like, hey, um, quite frankly, I'm not kicking off the majority of Nevadans Oh, don't forget the Veterans Administration also. I'm not kicking the majority of Nevadans off their health care to solve a problem for 11%. Now, maybe there's a part for them to play, but, but it's like, so when you talk about that, first of all, um, no repeal and replace. Identify the areas where we need to fix it. Let's fix it. And quite frankly, to the extent that employers and organizations play a central role in providing what, what is uh, quality, economic health care, then we'll let them continue to do that. You got, it. and we appreciate your support, Congressman. It, it, the frustration uh, from our end, and, and, and I can sense it in your voice that you share that, is that there was, a, you know, the ACA mandated health care. And there, to your point, I think there's some outstanding parts of that. But we found a way for, to make it affordable for small business. Uh, and more affordable for small business. And then we decided that we're gonna get, and I work in the insurance industry, we decided we're gonna give it to insurance companies. So I, 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 I struggle with that outcome at some level. Um, there's a question here that, that, uh, uh, that there's a rumor that earmarks are coming back. Is that, is that a thing or is that just a rumor? You know, there's been talk about it. And, and, and quite frankly, when you do your homework, once again, um, and, and listen, I'm at odds with former Speaker Boehner on this, when you saw how much money was actually spent in earmarks as a percentage of the budget, it, it, it was not a lot. It was not a big number. And so th there are some people that still, it's like for religion, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, but quite frankly, with a little more transparency in the process, I support earmarks. Um, if, if I want to make sure that, that the, the funds that are uh, allocable to Nevada go to, and I'll give you some examples. Um, Harry Reid, before, before the House got rid of him, um, Harry Reid was instrumental in getting new control powers at McCarran and Reno. And, and they go, oh my God, those were earmarks. It's like, well, you can call them whatever you want, but they were needed at both places. That wasn't like, hey, we're, putting some, we're hanging some tinsel on the Christmas tree. And so I think the transparency thing would help in terms of somebody said, hey, if you designated something for the three mile segment of I-11, through you know the, the Las Vegas corridor proper. And it's like, well, of course, because quite frankly, that's something that we need in terms of throughput. It's like, fine. The problem where earmarks got into trouble was because a lot of them surprised people. Like what, you got an earmark to paint, you know, everything in, in Las Vegas, Western warrior, you know, powder blue and red. Um, it's like, yeah, that's probably a little iffy. So I think transparency would help that process out a lot. And it would also, I think, um, help your representatives, no, no matter where you live, be a little bit more responsible in the appropriation process to the needs of their districts and their states. Yeah. So one final question, uh, Congressman. What would you like to see be done by the end of the year or, or before the new administration? And, and what do you think is possible? Uh, okay. Um, well, well, first of all, I, I think COVID relief is late a second round of COVID relief. And, and, and I'm just saying that as a policy guy. Um, I like the first round because out of like 2,200 possible votes on the four pieces of legislation in the Senate and House, there were only 62 no votes out of 2,200-ish possible votes. And so when you look at that, you go, wow, that was really bipartisan by the old definitions, you know, the old Richard Bryan, Allen Bible, Michael Callahan uh, um, definitions. And so to see it go from such a like, hey, we're doing the right thing and we're doing it fast and we're providing relief to, hey, guess what? Full stop because somebody thinks there's political gain to be had is, is just, it's a shameful thing and nothing for anybody in Congress to be proud of. So number one is do the COVID thing. 
Number two is, is basic housekeeping stuff, which is quite frankly, it's like, hey, uh, the House sent over appropriations bills to the Senate in July, and, and we're still the 12 appropriations bill. Defense authorization, one of the old must-pass bills is still messing around in terms of, and that's a big deal for Nevada when you talk about, well, they have this thing called Dallas Creech in your neighborhood, and they got this uh, Naval Air Station Fallon thing up a little farther north. And, and so it's like, you would think so. I'll tell you this though, because as I sit here and we're talking today, I'm like, well, so here's when we're going to do this, this, and that. There's, the, I mean, the, the schedule's out there, but nothing's filled in on it yet. Um, the fact that it'll, if it does come together, it'll come together at this point in time is not a great thing for people who like transparency, which I think is a good thing. Um, and, and so I guess I'll leave you with this thought. When you hear a rumor of when the Senate decides they're going home, that's when we'll be done for this year. So whether that's, <coughs> whether that's after Christmas or before, we'll see. But it's, uh, uh, I'm just looking forward to on January, hopefully, um, and then this may be the most naive thing anybody's ever said, um, but in January, maybe we'll start doing things in a little more methodical fashion, we'll see. Yeah. Congressman, we're grateful for your time. I, uh... As a Nevadan, I'm really proud of the fact that uh, in our state, we can reach out to other folks, our delegation, and I mean the entire delegation, and you've been, always been very gracious to the chamber. We're very thankful for that. But in a state like Nevada, where you can reach out and touch your lawmakers, it's a, it's a special thing. So uh, again, we are grateful for your generosity of your time and uh, appreciate your, your participation always. That goes both ways. Thank you guys too. You bet, you bet. Once again, I want to thank our presenting sponsor, Cox Communications, and our other sponsors, Allegiant Airlines, GC Garcia Company, the Howard Hughes Company, NV Energy, the Porter Group, Southwest Gas, Sunrise Healthcare, Switch, and Torrey University. And thank you all for joining us today. It's been a great day, a great learning experience. We're grateful for your, for your participation. Everybody be safe. Take care. <laughs>